like um, Walking Dead. Yeah, that's another. It's about zombies. That's I consider that well classic within the realm topic of, in geek uh, culture. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and then you also have shows like um, Dexter. I know Dexter isn't as much of a. Um, uh, it's about a serial killer, and that, but it seems like that's kind of more on the fringe. But still, it is very much uh, geek culture. I would say yeah, uh, it definitely one of the- falls into it. And I think also, uh, I, I, a lot of people said I, I recently had a conversation with a friend about this, and, and uh, we were talking about how sitcoms portray geek culture. And I like the stipulation he made was that. Community does a really good job portraying geek culture, and I sort of agree, but I think the the extra element I'd add to that, community does a good job of appealing to geek culture, and I think Big Bang Theory does the best job of portraying, like, geek culture. Just yes. a, purely on a, on, on a level of how many things they talk about that I'm into. Uh, by the way, uh, Community is an uh, American uh, comedy television series centered around a community college. Great show. It's another yeah. one of those shows, kind of like Firefly, where... There's really no bad actor. There's really no bad characters. I mean, there's no, characters yeah. that you're meant to dislike, but you're happy you can dislike them. Uh, yeah, it's great, wonderfully done. Great show, great characters, great comedy. Uh, it's on its fourth and probably final, and sadly final season yeah. now. Um, it's uh, it's on NBC. Um, so you're uh, I you highly recommend you check nights. it out. And you can check out Big Bang Theory by turning on the television, then switching to any channel. Any channel, yeah, exactly. Because I think it's on it's, what, five, oh, six num- channels now. Yeah, yeah, number one comedy. On television, yeah, uh, which is great. A show about geeks and which geek is cool. culture is yeah. now num- the number one show on television. Exactly, and a lot a lot of people say it does a bad job because of Sheldon, but I think quite the opposite because people react to Sheldon like he's crazy, yeah, like you would in real life, yeah. Uh, the uh, and I, I, I just think uh, I think the show was is quite well done, especially in its earlier seasons. So that's worth uh, worth checking out, and it sort of really did. I mean, geek protagonists are just not common. No, I mean you Let's had shows it. like. <laughs> There was a show that came out, uh, or a movie, I mean, that uh, that um, came out, I believe it was in the 80s, during that kind of like National Lampoon's phase. I think it was Revenge of the Nerds. Yes. And so you have shows like that. Um, you have movies uh, that ca- uh, there's a movie, that, a really great movie that came out a number of years ago called Fanboys. Fan <laughs> wow. Uh, and that was, a, that was a really great show. That was awesome. Yeah, yeah, it was a great movie. It's about a series of, uh, it's, a, it's a TV movie about uh, these group of people who want to see, it takes place in 1999, they want to see the new Star Wars movie uh, before it is released in theaters. And that's a really funny movie. Uh, and then you have movies, I guess, kind of like... Wait, wait, hold on. Is Fanboys the funny movie, or was the new Star Wars movie back then the funny, the funny movie? We'll get into Star Wars on a later show, because... Uh, we, Do we have a show for that? We'll, is it on the schedule? We'll put it on the schedule. We'll put it on the schedule. Why not? It's, it's Star Wars. I mean, we're going to talk about it at some point. Exactly. And um, we're also going to review Star Trek at some point. Yes. We're both going to see Star Trek. Oh, I'll that's another thing I want times. to say. Uh, Star okay, Trek yeah. is another series that has, uh, since it's been kind of rebooted uh, with the new movies, I mean, it's become way more popular. Yeah. Because, exactly. I mean, I, I love Star Trek. Love, absolutely love The Next Generation, one of my favorite TV shows. Um, but it was never... It was popular, but it was never this mainstream as the current Star War, as the current Star yeah. Trek movie is the uh, the for, uh, the 2009 reboot and its sequel uh, Into Darkness. Yeah, and and the 2009 reboot is superb. It's unbelievably well done, and, and it appeals both to uh, to Trekkies and non Trekkies alike. Um, and no, that term is not offensive. No. Uh, the uh, I also like. I think I think this is a good opportunity to bring up a distinction we were talking about this morning before the show. Um, which was the difference between sort of hard and light sci-fi, which I also think ends up being the exact same relationship between high-tech, low-tech sci-fi. Yeah. The high-tech sci-fi is usually what we call the hard sci-fi, and that's – it doesn't really deal so much – see, I, I'll contrast it to low-tech sci-fi or light sci-fi. Can I give you an example of low-tech sci-fi? Firefly? Yes. <laughs> there we go. I do, that's the first one that comes to my mind as well. Yeah. The uh, and Firefly, Battlestar is another good example. Yeah. Uh, these, are, these are shows that essentially – they could take place in – the fact that they're sci-fi is a purely creative decision. Yes. It, it's, it's – usually it's just people doing – having people conflicts. But they just happen to be shooting lasers and flying around in spaceships. For example, yeah. you, you could have easily had Firefly been about 18th century pirates. Yeah, exactly. Or like 17th – or a 14th century samurai. Yeah, it, it could have been about they, anything. They just, they just stuck them in space because it's a cool setting, but it, there's nothing really – they're not exploring the realms of philosophy and humanity like hard sci-fi tends to do. Yeah, it, hard sci-fi definitely tends to be more of that, uh, and it, it capitalizes. Like, let's face it, Star Trek just couldn't take place just anywhere. No, it wouldn't. It wouldn't make any sense because only in space is there that sort of uh, wonder sense of and... loneliness and wonder and wondering and sort of hopefulness. 
Uh, and and uh, mystery. Yeah, you exactly. Know what I mean? yeah. Like, the only real way that you could do it anywhere else, I guess, is like if you were like an explorer traveling to um uh, to like the new continent back in the 14th, 15th uh, centuries. Yeah. But even then, it's not the same. It starts with there's something wondrous and scary and joyous and lonely, like the, all the words that you were saying about Star Trek, and that can only really take place in space. Another yeah. good example of uh, high or or high tech sci fi is um, uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey. Yeah, which very you, good example. Which, if you ever read the uh, book or watched the movie, is very much about um, dealing with the fallibility of, of mankind versus you know the infallibility of the machines that we make. And then he becomes a star trial and kind of lose track of the narrative. But that doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it deals, high sci-fi it deals more with philosophy. It deals more with the more, uh, what makes us human. good example of this is the character of Data from The Next Generation. They used Great him example. to explore what it is to be human because he himself is not human but is trying to be so. He's an android. Yeah, what exactly human means, what exactly it means to be really uh, conscious or sentient. Yeah. Uh, and a measure of a man being the... the Measure of Man, and also the one where he builds law. Uh, yeah, uh, Beloved, I think that's called. Yes, uh, and uh, both are w- of which are sort of the, I think, the prime case studies of that. Yeah. Uh, but you're right. I mean, the Star Trek really capitalizes on the fact that it's space. Yeah. And which at any time, let's face it, I mean, even now, with all we've gained in knowledge since since Star Trek, and you can see the yeah. references sort of pop up, fellow math nerds will notice that Picard tries to solve or approve Fermat's last theorem, which we've since proved, uh, and... And stuff like that. I mean, it, it's still startling to us yeah. to see to see them go through and explore all these places that we could, we can't even imagine. Yeah, uh, and, like episodes where they meet uh, Nagilum, the giant cat uh, in space. Don't it, remember that. <laughs> they like, they fly into like a, a cloud or something. and He has to keep them there. And he starts oh, killing off crew members. Oh yeah, I remember he, that. He's like playing his own little experiment. He does look like a cat. I mean, there's no way around it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, that that stuff is still fascinating. Whereas, you know, like you say, Firefly could be anywhere, and I, I like that about it. Also, 2001: A Space Odyssey for my fellow science nerds uh, features, I believe, what is in film the most realistic actual um, like representation of what it's like to be in space without a helmet. Uh, it it because most movies do that wrong just because no one does the research. Yeah, because uh, most people think your head explodes. It mo- yeah, most people think you blow up, much like you do in yeah. The Simpsons. When, but uh, when you just freeze, you just get really cold, pretty really, fast. But yeah. not like not like it is in Danny Boyle's Sunshine, which although I love the movie, totally unrealistic. Guy sticks his head out the window, just becomes ice. I'm like, not not quite, dude. Uh, but Space Odyssey does it right. So um so well done. Uh, well, if they're well, listening. Well done, man. <laughs> you have our approval, and yeah, we you, give you a salute. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we, maybe we should have our own award thing. I know the British uh, film critic Mark Kermode has his own thing, the Kermode Awards, that he awards after the Oscars. We'll, we'll uh, send them a little plastic trophy that we'll pick up at the dollar store. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I actually, I actually kind of want to want to get those trophies now. Yeah. And we'll probably do we'll do that uh, January, like or the uh, the end of December. <laughs> Yeah, you know what? Yeah, let's actually do that. Let's let's do a uh, yes, yeah, right, folks. We're gonna plan the show for you right now. The uh, <laughs> we'll we'll do a, a sort of a year in review yeah. of all the things that happened in geek culture, and a lot happened this year. You know what? Can we talk about Iron Man three? Uh, sure. We okay, sure. Iron Man 3. Yeah, we have no topic, so no. <laughs> we're just gonna. We're- it- uh, today, uh, the, I guess the topic of today's show before we get on the Iron Man is yeah. we're going to talk, it's an introduction show to get, uh, so you can get to know us and you can get to know kind of our opinions and what movies we like, what TV we like and what, what about geek culture we like, um, geek and nerd culture. So yeah, Iron Man 3, uh, fantastic movie. Yeah. Before Rory gets into it, cause I know he has a couple of things to say. I want to say this. Okay. Iron Man has terrible villains. I know there are going to be friends out there that I have, one in particular I know of who, are, like, they love Iron Man. I'm sorry, but he has terrible villains. When the most memorable of your villains out of all of them, and he doesn't have that many, but when the only villain villain, villain that I know of personally, besides uh, before watching the movie, is a man called the Mandarin, whose power is he, he has ten magical rings, and a dragon called Yan Fin, I think his name is. And he, for Iron Man, I mean that doesn't. He's not. A, he's not a very good. He doesn't have a lot of great villains. So as in the other two previous Iron Man movies, he doesn't. In this movie, he doesn't really have that well of a, of a developed villain. Now it's more developed than um, uh, Whiplash, which was the villain from Number Two, or Obadiah Stane from the first one. And he he has more of a character arc. He you you kind of get where he's coming from. I still don't. I have no idea what his motivation is. I think his motivation is, is, ah, oh, he's evil. 